Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to another uh, session with uh, our brother Sam Shimon. This is the uh, Q and A, uh, you know, uh, videos that we've been doing uh, lately, and it's been a lot of fun, a lot of joy, and uh, really the timing also for us uh, has been perfect because it's late night or for us at least, and hopefully this will accommodate many of you who are at in the Asia side of uh, you know the world. So. With that in mind, um, uh, I want to make sure that you know that uh, this is a Q&A. Therefore, please send us your questions. Yep. Make sure the questions are applicable to uh, topics related to apologetics, but in particular, things related to Islamic apologetics or biblical issues. And uh, at the same time, from time to time, Sam may have his Skype open. Yes. So that's the case. Yeah. We will let you know as well to prompt you when he's ready for that. With that in mind, thank you so much, brother. Uh, tell us a little bit more about you, man. You've been uh, traveling the world lately. What's going well, on? Well, first of all, praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We invoke the Father in Jesus' name for the glory of His Son, the Lord Jesus, to fill us with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> to strengthen you and I, to speak truth without error, to recall the Scriptures perfectly, to present Islam correctly with the purpose of, that our Lord Jesus will be exalted and that the Spirit will draw Muslims to the true Son of God and strengthen the church for the glory of Jesus. And may the Father give us the health we need to serve the Lord and the holiness to delight his heart. Thank you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you. Have your way with this session in our lives in Jesus' almighty name. <clears throat> yep. Sorry, guys. If you see me bending over, I'm trying to give my cat attention. You guys know that we took in a Stray cat, neighborhood cat, pretty much she lives with us. <clears throat> so I've been away for a while. Yeah, I was in, I think, uh, California. Not I think, but I don't know if it's northern or southern. Modesto Turlock. I'll be traveling if the Lord Jesus permits me. Not for the purpose of vacation. My traveling is for the purpose of meeting brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that <clears throat> the COVID restrictions are being loosened. I want to meet brothers and sisters locally, get to encourage them, pray with them, serve them. So Lord willing, I'll be in Florida, if the Lord wills, Monday, and I'll be there from the 13th to 26th, traveling the state of Florida, Orlando, Fort Myers, Tampa. If you're there, reach out to me. I'll meet you because that's my purpose. I'll still be doing live streams. I'll still be doing shows. And Lord willing, I'll still be writing articles, but meeting people. So if you want to meet me one-on-one, -on -one, let me know if you want to meet, <clears throat> have me come meet your group, do a study session. I'm available and don't worry about costs. We don't charge. So it's not like hey, you have to pay me a fee. We don't do that. If the Lord puts in your heart to support the ministries, amen. If not, freely we receive, freely we give as our Lord Jesus commanded in Matthew 10 verse 8. And again, brother, I pray in Jesus name, the last thing that goes from our body is our voice and our sight to use our sight to glorify Christ by reading his word and our voice to preach his word in Jesus' name, right? Because I'm getting old. I don't know. Amen, brother. Amen. Okay. So um, you ready, brother, to start to dive into things? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so we have a quick question here. So maybe we'll, we'll start with the question. And the question is, some Muslims claim that there is a difference between Koryos and Theos when it applies to Jesus. So okay. what say you? All right. Really? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, as I'm answering the question, I did send you some links on the subject you wanted to discuss. Feel free yeah, to share. Definitely. Let me, you you three of them. <clears throat> Let me give you the third one, and then I'll answer this question. But just, brother, have your Bible ready, and you can read any version you want. So I just sent okay. you three links to three articles because the brother did want me to address, does Allah know everything? No, he doesn't. The Quran shows that Allah is not all-knowing, and he's the all-guessing one and hopeful one. And in Jesus' name, we'll get to that. But as far as this can, question is concerned, <clears throat> it is true, the Greek words, because I guess the brother asked you about the Greek terms, right? He said theos and kurios. Or kurios. Right. And by the way, in seminary and Bible college, they teach Christians the Erasmian pronunciation of the Greek New Testament. Native Greek speakers will have no clue what we're talking about when we pretend to be pronouncing the Greek of the New Testament. So is there a difference between theos, theos, and uh, kurios, or kurios, however you want to pronounce it? 
Krios, Kyrios. I've heard Greek speakers say Kyrios, Kyrios, Mo. Anyway, well, yes, there is a difference. The word uh, Kyrios or Kurios is simply the Greek word for Lord or Master. Okay, so it's true. You can be a Kurios or Kyrios and not be God. The word Theos or uh, Theos, Theos <clears throat> is the word, the Greek word, typically translated as God. So when you want to refer to a deity, a divine being, or the true God in Greek, you'll use the word Theos, Theos. When you want to refer to someone who's your master, your owner, Lord, master, owner, you can use the word Kurios or Kyrios. However, in light of the question, the Muslim is trying to show that Jesus being called Kurios or Kyrios doesn't mean he is God because the word Kurios, Kyrios can also mean Lord, Master, or Owner, not necessarily God. So that's the objection. With that said, let me show you how the word Kurios, Kyrios is used of Jesus in the New Testament. So let's begin an in-depth session in Christian Theology 101. This is basics of the Christian faith. Though it's true, though it's true that the word kurios, kirius, doesn't necessarily mean God, right? It can mean Lord, Master, Owner. For those of you who may not be familiar with the various versions of the Old Testament. Sorry, it's my brother's coming in with some stuff. Say, so, hey, that's what happens when it's live. When the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek... Now, let me give you a little history lesson because you guys asked for it. We're trying to give you spiritual meat and trying to make it as simple as possible. So you don't need to be a scholar to know this stuff, because if being a scholar was a prerequisite, then there'd be no hope for my brother, Al. But thank God you don't need to be a scholar. So, Al, there's hope for you. But anyway, because of Alexander the Great, Alexander Macedonia, the Greek, conquering the world, he Hellenized the world. So the... <clears throat> Ling, lingua franca, the international language for many centuries became Greek. And the Jews were scattered <clears throat> out of their land due to the Babylonian captivity. Many of them did not return to their homeland, and many of them could no longer read or write Hebrew. In fact, many of them couldn't even read or write Aramaic. They were only able to read and write in Greek. So, for the benefit of those Jews, so give me history. It's all going to tie in. I'm not trying to impress you with this historical data. It ties in. It has a reason that there's a purpose. <clears throat> because they couldn't read or write their mother tongue or Aramaic, Jews translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek for their benefit so they would not lose their religious foundation. When those translations were made, we have indication and evidence, at least as far as the extent, the surviving Greek copies of the Hebrew Bible are concerned. Oftentimes, they rendered the divine name, yod He wau He or yod He vav He variously pronounced as Yahweh. I've heard people pronounce it Yehovah, Yehoah, Yahweh, was rendered as Kurios, Kerius, Kurios. In other words, instead of taking the divine name and retaining it in Greek. And by the way, we do have evidence that some Jews did that. We have, in fact, I don't know if you heard about this, brother. Just recently, they discovered ancient Greek fragments of <clears throat> Ezra and Nahum from the Dead Sea Scrolls dated around the second century AD after the time of Christ, where in these fragments of Ezra and Nahum translated in Greek, so it shows you the Jews were translating the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. You'll find the divine name of God retained in the Greek with Hebrew letters. So we do have evidence. We do have evidence that <clears throat> there were Jewish scribes that when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, they would still retain the divine name either by using Hebrew letters or the Greek form of the divine name. However, we also have evidence that not all Jews did this. Many Jews would use the word kurios, kerius, in place of the divine name, right? Why? Well, because of this Jewish tradition that tried to safeguard 
any <clears throat> profaning of the divine name because of Exodus 20 verse 7 there the Israelites are forbidden from misusing the divine name taking the name of Yahovah their God in vain so in order to safeguard against violating that command and profaning the divine name the Jews got in the habit of using a synonym or substitute for the divine name in Hebrew they used Adonai in Aramaic it would be Mar in Greek it was Kurios now I hope I'm not going too fast I'm trying to be very slow and methodical so you can understand so I want everyone to see that when the Jews got into the habit of no longer pronouncing the sacred name out of fear of profaning it profaning it taking it in vain they would use substitutes or synonyms in Hebrew they would use the word Adonai the Greek equivalent of Adonai is kurios kerius because Adonai in Hebrew also means Lord or Master Aramaic they would use the word mar therefore you'll find that when the inspired authors of the New Testament writing in Greek quote an Old Testament text that contains the divine name you'll find that in the Greek they don't use the divine name they use the word kurios kerius for example brother go to Mark 12 29 to 30 remember Mark wrote in Greek he wrote in Greek we're going to get a translation of it in English and you can confirm this anyone who reads Greek read the Greek New Testament read the Greek Mark because Mark was written in Greek or just look at any lexicon and this will be affirmed but now go to Mark 12 29 to 30 all right 29 to 30 Mark 12 29 Jesus answered the most important is hero Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength now here our Lord Jesus is citing Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 5 when Mark records the words of our Lord he does so in Greek now if you look at the Hebrew of Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 5 it says hero Israel and by the way the word here is Shema this is why scholars refer to Deuteronomy 6 4 and 5 as the Shema Shema Yisrael, Yahovah or Yahweh, I remember pronounce it, Eloheinu, Yahovah, Yahweh Echad, right? And then it says, you shall love Yahovah, your God, with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Now, when Mark writes this in Greek, he doesn't use the word Yahovah or Yahweh. Instead, he uses the Greek word kurios or kerios. In fact, if you're reading the Greek, if you're reading the Greek, and those of you who are from Greek speaking churches like the Greek Orthodox, that's all you do is read the Bible in Greek. You'll see that the Greek here says, Akue Israel, going by memory, and hopefully the Lord enables me to recall these facts correctly. Akue, Akue Israel, <clears throat> Kurius o Theos Hemon, Kurius Eis Eis Estin, or Heis Estin. So there it's kurios or kurios, kerios, kurios. Our God, kurios, is one. And you shall love kurios, your God, kerios, your God, with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. So you guys see it? Here, Matt Mark writing in Greek, not Matthew, Mark writing in Greek, does not use the divine name yod he vav he or yod he wow he. Instead, he uses the Greek synonym substitute kurios, kerius. What does that mean? That means, as far as the Greek New Testament is concerned, the Greek word kurios, kerius, I'll just say kurios from now on, kurios, though meaning Lord, Master, Owner, was often used as the surrogate, the replacement, or the synonym for God's divine name. In other words, it is not necessarily the case that kurios refers to someone who's not god because kurios was used for the divine name of the true god and his divine name is yod he vav he yod he wow he jehovah yahovah yahovah yahweh so now the real question is this brother is there evidence from the new testament 
that when Jesus is called Kurias, Kurias, the New Testament writers intended by the use of that name to identify Jesus as Jehovah, as Yahweh, and not merely as your master, your Lord and owner. Absolutely. Here, let me show you. Go to Joel, Joel 2.32. Joel 2.32. All right. Joel 2.32. All right. Uh, Joel 2.32 reads, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Okay, now, the Hebrew word for Lord is Jehovah. Yahweh, Yahovah. So I don't know. People are more comfortable with the word Yahweh. Some are more comfortable with Yahweh. Others, Yahovah, Jehovah. For convenience sake, I will use the anglicized enunciation of the divine name. I'll just say Jehovah. The Hebrew has the divine name. And by the way, side note. For those of you who are not aware, God's divine name appears more than 7,000 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. But in the case of many translations in the Old Testament, they have chosen not to render it as Jehovah or Yahweh or Yahovah. There are a few translations that do, like the American Standard Version will retain Jehovah. The World English Bible will have the word Yahweh, and the New Jerusalem Bible has the word Yahweh. But the other English translations have chosen to replace the divine name Yahweh or Yahovah, Yahweh with the word Lord, as you saw in the translation our brother read. He's reading Joel 2.32, but that English translation rendered the divine name as Lord. So instead of saying, whoever calls on the name of Jehovah, your translation said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. But keep in mind, the Hebrew has the divine name. It literally reads, Whoever calls on the name of Jehovah, whoever Jehovah calls. Now, when it was rendered in Greek, now, guys, make sure you're getting this and help me help you. Let me know if you're getting this. When it was rendered in Greek, in the Greek version, it actually uses the word Lord, kurios, kurios. So in the Greek, it says, whoever calls on the name of kurios shall be saved, kurios, Lord. So here, the Greek uses the word kurios, Lord, in place of Jehovah. Why is that important? Let's go to Romans 10, verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. All right. Romans 10. And by the way, folks, I did post for you the Greek readings of Mark 12, uh, 28 and 29. You'll see that the word there is kurios. Um, okay, so Mark 10, uh, no, Ma Romans, sorry, uh, Romans, Romans 10, verse 9. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to start from uh, 9 here. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be, uh, you will be saved. Okay, now don't forget who the Lord is in this context that you must confess verbally. Notice you must confess, meaning it's with your mouth, a confession verbally, audibly for others to see, a confession in front of witnesses. So Paul's saying you must verbally, audibly confess in front of witnesses that Jesus is Lord, literally the Lord Jesus. Jesus is Lord, and then have no doubt in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So note it's Jesus whom you must confess audibly, verbally, in the presence of witnesses, as Lord to be saved. Don't forget that. Now read verses 10 to 12. All right. So Romans 10, verses 10 to 12. Verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jews and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Now pause right there. He's saying 
It doesn't matter ethnically you're Jewish or Greek, Gentile, because there's only one Lord for everyone. The same Lord who saves the Jews is the same Lord who saves the Greeks. There's only one Lord over all creation. That is the one and same Lord everyone must call on. Now, in context, that same Lord of all is who? Who is that one and same Lord whom both Jews and Greeks must call on because they have no other Lord that can save them besides one, and he's the same Lord for all creatures. Who is that Lord? Verse 9, who was it? Our Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt, right? So right. now, if once you establish that, now, brother, one more time, reread 12 and then read 13. All right. No, it's not Jehovah. It's Jesus in context, Gadiel. Follow context. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. All right. 12 starting, starting from verse 12 again, Romans 10, verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now you see what Paul did? Paul cited Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And he used the Greek word kurios, 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 Lord in place of Jehovah. And he says, you must call on the name of the Lord to be saved, irrespective if you're Jewish or Greek, because the Hebrew Bible clearly says the only way a person can be saved is by calling on the name of that Lord. But hold on. He quotes Joel 2.32 and uses the word kurios, Lord, instead of Jehovah, in the context of insisting that Jews and Gentiles must confess with their mouth and believe in their heart, Jesus is the Lord, whom God raised from the dead. He is the Lord that they must call on. He is the Lord they must confess with their mouth to be saved. They cannot call on any other Lord because he's the Lord of all. And then he backs it up by saying, see, Joel 2.32 says, you must call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Therefore, I exhort you, call on the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. So here, Paul identifies Jesus as Lord, not merely in the sense of the one who owns us, the one who's our master and possessor, but as the Lord Jehovah. So here, kurios is used of Jesus in the sense that he is Jehovah of the Old Testament, that you must call on to be saved. See? Let me just give one more example for the sake of time. I could be here all day doing this, but one more example for the sake of time. Let's go to Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5. <clears throat> all right. Isaiah 40, yeah. verses 3 and 5. All right, verse 3. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 5, and the glory of the Lord. Five. Let's go 3, 2, 5. Don't skip four. Okay. All Sorry. right. Because I heard you say 3 and 5, so no problem. Uh, we'll start from 3 again. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So if you've been paying attention to what he just read, it says that <clears throat> there'll be a voice crying out in the wilderness, a voice in the wilderness will cry out telling the people to be prepared for <clears throat> the Lord Jehovah prepare the way for Jehovah here in the Hebrew it uses the divine name make straight in the desert a highway for our God so this voice is being sent to prepare the people for the coming of Jehovah Israel's God he's not preparing people for the coming of a creature read it carefully He's not preparing people for the coming of a creature. This voice is announcing to people in the wilderness, get ready. Jehovah our God is going to show up. And when he shows up, all flesh will see his glory. So who's coming? Jehovah, Israel's God. 
Whose glory will they see? Jehovah's glory. When will they see it? After this voice cries out in the wilderness, preparing them for the advent of Jehovah. Now, as far as the Gospels are concerned, who was that voice in the wilderness that came preparing people for the coming of Jehovah, Israel's God? You don't need to guess. Go to Luke 3, read verses 1 to 6, brother. Luke 3, verses 1 to 6. Luke 3, verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> I can't hear you, brother. There's no sound. I don't know if you're even there. All right. Luke 3, starting from verse 1. Yeah. I'll go all the way to 6, correct? Yes. Read it. Because notice Luke is going to quote Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5 in reference to who? Exactly. All right. Verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Eturia, and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Ananias or Anas and uh, Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So notice, John the Baptist is the fulfillment of the voice in the wilderness who cries out and prepares the people for the coming of Jehovah, Israel's God. So as far as the New Testament's concerned, as far as Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts are concerned, John the Baptist fulfills Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5, because he is the voice that Isaiah the prophet foresaw, crying out in the wilderness, telling Israel, Jehovah, our God is coming. Get ready for him. Now let's see what John the Baptist himself says about his role. As you go to John, the Gospel of John, read chapter 1, verse 23. All right, Gospel of John, chapter 1. Verse 23. Now, John the Baptist describes his ministry in the words of who? Okay. So here, the context, basically, the Pharisees send a delegation to ask John about his identity. Uh, here is his answer to one of those questions. In verse 23, he says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. You can't get any clearer than John the Baptist himself saying, I am fulfilling Isaiah 40, verse 3. I am that voice that Isaiah said would come and cry in the wilderness. So we have established that. Now, don't forget, guys, if you don't make the connection, you're not going to be able to prove your point. John is the voice of Isaiah 40, who cries in the wilderness, preparing not for a creature, but for Jehovah, Israel's God. That means John, his appearance signifies Jehovah is about to show up. Jehovah is going to appear in Jerusalem, in Judea, and he's going to appear visibly to his people. Now the question is, who did John prepare for? Well, we know it's Jehovah God. But who specifically, which person of the Godhead? You don't need to guess. John himself will say in that very chapter of the Gospel of John, and it's confirmed in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not just John. Matthew says the same thing. Luke says the same thing. Mark says the same thing. And Acts says the same thing. But now notice what the Baptist says in the Gospel of John. Read John 1, 26, all the way to 28. All right. Starting from verse 26, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. 
even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now you saw that he's saying there's someone who is after me who's already here. Even though he's going to appear after me, he's already here. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough to stoop down and untie his sandals or carry his sandals because he ranks before me. Well, who is that, John? Read 29 to 34. Same chapter, 29 to 34. All right, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Verse 34, and I have seen and I have bore witness that this is the Son of God. Okay, now why this is amazing. When Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John quote Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5, in the case of Matthew and Mark and John, they only quote Isaiah 40, verse 3. There in the Hebrew, it's the divine name Jehovah. But when they quote it in Greek, because the New Testament is written in Greek, they don't use the word Jehovah. They use the Greek word kurios. 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 Kerios. Are you seeing what's happening here? The word Jehovah is rendered not as Jehovah in the Greek, but they use the word kurios as a synonym, as a substitute for the divine name. So here you have proof from the New Testament that the word kurios, though it can mean master, lord, and owner, it is used often as the Greek equivalent, the Greek synonym, the Greek substitute for the true name of the true God, Jehovah. And here it is Jesus who's being identified as that kurios, as that Jehovah who became flesh. So no, Jesus isn't simply called kurios, kurios, in the sense that he is Lord, master, owner. He is all of that. But he's being called kurios, kurios, in context in which that name, Kurios, is being used in the place of the word Jehovah, thereby identifying Jesus as that Jehovah God Almighty of the Old Testament who became flesh. And yet notice here in John 1, you have the Trinity. Though Jesus is identified as Jehovah, whom Isaiah said would appear visibly, John says that he is the Lamb of God, the Son of God. So he's not the Father, and the Father is not him. And John said that God the Father said, when you see the Holy Spirit come down upon him in bodily shape as a dove, then you know it's him. So notice, Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. <clears throat> the Father is not Jesus. And yet Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Spirit. And yet we know the Father is Jehovah and the Spirit is the eternal Spirit of Jehovah. There's your Trinity right there in John 1. John 1 if you start from verses 19 and read all the way to 36, though we didn't read all of that, there is your Trinity. And Jesus is clearly Jehovah God of Israel who became flesh and appeared visibly. One more line of evidence, brother. I know we took a long time, but I think it's oh, important. That's okay. And, and, and of course, Sam, they can go always to the baptism of Jesus in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 14, 17, and they can see exactly what John the Baptist was describing. Yep. And it's in Mark as well, and it's in Luke. It's mm -hmm. Acts 19, verse 4, where Paul says, John told people to follow the one who'd come after him, that is Christ. Anyway, but now more evidence that Jesus is called kurios in the sense that he's God Almighty, not kurios in the sense that he's the Lord, owner, and master, which he is. He is our Lord. He does own us. He is the master of all creation because he's God in the flesh. Let me give you a few more examples. Go to Deuteronomy 10, 17, brother. Okay, Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. Yep. 
Deuteronomy 10, 17, Christ is unconditional love is a brother in Christ. I don't know why his message got deleted. Maybe he deleted it. But anyway, Deuteronomy 10, 17. All right. Uh, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. Now, the you before you finish it, brother, just stop right there. I want them to catch. Notice Jehovah your God. It's Jehovah your God. Rendered as Lord your God. He is the Lord of lords. Ask any anti-Trinitarian. Ask any Jew in the Old Testament, can you have someone other than Jehovah in heaven reigning as Lord of Lords? Can you have someone in heaven who reigns as Lord of Lords other than Jehovah? No, only Jehovah, Jehovah alone, reigns in heaven as Lord of all Lords. Now finish the verse, brother. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no problem. He's the Lord of Lords. Uh, so I'm going to read again the beginning of 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. Okay, now one more. Psalm 136, verse 3. Psalm 136, verse 3. Okay. Psalm 136. Verse 3. Very good. Okay, Psalm 136, verse 3 reads, Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Again, my challenge to the anti-Trinitarians, my challenge to <clears throat> Jews, anyone who denies the Trinity and that Jesus is God. Can you show me a single place in the Old Testament where someone other than Jehovah in heaven, someone in heaven reigns as Lord of Lords beside Jehovah or alongside of Jehovah? You can't find it. There's only one in heaven that reigns as Lord of Lords, Jehovah God Almighty. Well, now explain Revelation 17, 14 for me, brother. Revelation 17, verse 14. All right. Revelation 17, verse 14 reads, They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now notice here the Greek word is kurios. Jesus is the kurios over all other uh, kurioi or kuriois, the plural. And he is in heaven reigning as Lord of lords, King of kings. He's in heaven seated at the right hand of God the Father, and in heaven he is the Lord over all lords, the King over all kings. This could not be ascribed to Jesus if Jesus isn't Jehovah God Almighty. So notice, he is kurios in the sense of being Jehovah in the flesh, though he's not the Father or the Holy Spirit. And what's amazing, you have hadiths in Bukhari. In fact, someone just quoted it, David Medina. Interesting you mentioned it. In Bukhari, in Muslim, where it says the most vile title in the sight of Allah is a man calling himself Malik al-Amlak, King of Kings. And yet here in Revelation 17, 14, Jesus is not only Lord of Lords, he's King of Kings. There you go. I hope that answered the question. I could be here all night answering it, but for the sake of time, I hope that answered the question thoroughly. Oh, absolutely, brother. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to derail you, but when I saw the question, I wanted just to make sure we address it. So would you like to venture into uh, sure. Allah's knowledge or well, lack by of the way, I did send you my article, a very older article that I wrote on this very point. Does kurios, kurios mean deity in reference to Jesus? I sent it to you in the, in the chat, private chat. I don't have the ability to post it in your YouTube section. So if you want to share that for their benefit, I already wrote, wrote an article on this. And I give you a lot more information in the article that when Jesus is called Kurios, when the Greek New Testament ascribes Kurios to Jesus, it means that, yes, he is our Lord. He is our master. He is our owner. He owns creation because he is Jehovah. He's Kurios in the sense of being Jehovah in the flesh. So right, with that said, let's go into the topic. He's giving you the links, brethren. Save the links. Click on them. Use the material, upload them to your sites, translate them. You have my full authorization to do so for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, what do you want me to address next, my brother? Let's talk about Allah's lack of knowledge. And you sure you uh, want Jennifer to do that? Yamamoto, thank you so much for your super chat. You sure you want to do that, bro? Yeah, if you want. I mean, you want sure, something? Of course I do. No, of course. All right. Right. You're making me happy, man. What you talking about, brother? Guys, 
we're now going to turn the tables on Muslims. Why? Because Muslims often will attack the Bible for attributing what seems to be ignorance on the part of God, even though these are what we call literary features, devices, in fact, <clears throat> anthropomorphisms, where God will speak as if he's a man and describe himself in ways that are analogous to the way humans describe themselves in order for us to get an idea of how God thinks and acts, even though God's thoughts and ways transcend ours. Be that as it may, because Muslims are not satisfied with our harmonization or reconciliation of these passages that are found throughout the Bible, <clears throat> where God is depicted as if he needs to search things out in order to discover whether things that have been reported to him are true or not and reconcile those statements with the plain teachings of the Bible that the true God is infinitely wise, possessing infinite knowledge, and knows everything perfectly and knows the end from the beginning, even though Christians have offered Ways of harmonizing these statements. Muslims say, no, we reject them. Your Bible's full of contradictions. It can't be the word of God. Well, guess what? Now we're going to turn the tables. It's time to give Muslims a taste of their own medicine. It's going to shock many Christians to hear, and I already gave him three articles. He's got the links to three articles that I wrote showing that according to the Quran, Allah repents. Allah changes his mind. Allah has to put people in certain situations so he can learn things about them because Allah doesn't know everything. Booyah shaka. Are we ready? We're always ready, man, to expose Allah. Booyah shaka. All right, let's begin. All right, chapter 3, verses 140 to 142 of the Quran. Chapter 3, verses 140 to 142. Then I'm going to read some Muslim commentators who struggle with these passages. All right, this is from the Shakir translation. Some pronounce it Shakir, like Shakira. All right, anyway. If a wound has afflicted you at Uhud, a wound like it has also afflicted the unbelieving people. And we bring these days to men by turns that Allah may know. Why does Allah test people? Why does Allah put people in certain situations? That Allah may know those who believe and take witnesses from among you, martyrs. And Allah does not love the unjust. And that he may purge those who believe and deprive the unbelievers of blessings. Do you think that you'll enter the garden while, while Allah has not yet known? Literal translation by Shak Shakir. Allah has not yet known those who strive hard from among you. And he has not known the patient. Oh, my goodness. The Arabic Quran, in clear Arabic, in unambiguous Arabic, says Allah will put people in situations to test them so that Allah may learn and know and discover something about them. Wow, brother. I got a few more. And there's a lot of other lines of evidence. Chapter 3, verses 166 to 167. Chapter 3, verses 166 to 167. That which befell you on the day when the two armies met was by permission of Allah. Why did Allah allow the Muslims to fight the unbelievers? Here you go, my brother. That he might know the true believers and that he might know the hypocrites unto whom it was said, come, <clears throat> fight in the way of Allah or defend yourselves. They answered, if we knew aught of fighting, we would follow you. If we knew how to fight, we'd follow you. We don't know how to fight. On that day, they were nearer disbelief than faith. They utter with their mouths a thing which is not in their hearts. Allah is the best aware of what they hide. Did you catch it? Why did Allah put Muslims in a situation where they had to fight and kill? So that Allah could learn and know and discover the true Muslims from the hypocrites, the munafiqeen. But brother, I thought Allah knows everything. Why does Allah have to test you to find out and learn and know something about you? Well, wait, before you answer, I got a few more references. A few more references. Okay, chapter 5, verse 94 of the Quran. <clears throat> chapter 5, verse 94. All of this is from my articles, by the way. Oh, you who believe, 
Allah will certainly try you in respect of some game which your hands and your lances can reach that Allah might know. Allah might know who fears him in secret. Whatever exceeds the limit after this, he shall have a painful punishment. Now, it gets a little worse for the Muslims and better for us. Chapter 11, verse 12. Chapter 11, verse 12. Then it may be. Now remember, guys, this is the speech of Allah. This is the speech of Allah. So Allah is saying, it may be. Maybe, maybe not. It may be if they believe not in the statement that thou will torment thy soul with grief over their footsteps. Hold on, Allah. Don't you know? Don't you know that Muhammad would react this way if this happened? Why are you saying it may be, maybe Muhammad, you'll be stricken with grief if this happens? You don't know? By the way, that was chapter 18, verse 6. Chapter 11, verse 12. Chapter 11, verse 12. Then it may be, Allah, you don't know? Maybe this, maybe that. It may be that you will give up part of what is revealed to you and your breasts will become <clears throat> straightened, constricted by it because they say, why has not a treasure been sent down upon him or an angel come with him? You're only a warner and Allah is custodian over all things. Now watch, watch this, 26 verse 3. 26 verse 3, it may be thou, you Muhammad, will kill your soul with grief that they do not become believers. Now again, I'm confused. Allah, don't you know how Muhammad would react in a given situation? Why are you saying, maybe you're going to do this, Muhammad? Maybe you're going to react this way, Muhammad? Maybe? You don't know? Okay, hold on. Chapter 80, verses 1 to 4. Chapter 80, verses 1 to 4. He frowned and turned away. This is Muhammad being rebuked by Allah. Muhammad frowned and turned away because the blind man came unto him. What could inform you but that he might, he might, maybe, he might have grown in grace or may have taken heed and so the reminder might have availed him. Okay, again, I'm confused. Allah, you do not know whether the blind man may have accepted the warning, may have believed in Muhammad's message, and may have grown as a result of it. You're not certain? Really? Okay, a few more. 47 verse 31. Chapter 47 verse 31. And most certainly we will try you until we have known 47 verse 31, Muslims. And most certainly, we will try you until we have known those among you who exert themselves hard. Wait, so Allah is going to test Muslims so that Allah could learn, discover, and know which Muslims will work hard, which Muslims will strive harder than others? Really? Oh, my goodness. Now, for the sake of time, brother, I'm going to skip how the Muslim scholars dealt with this and how they were troubled by these passages of the Arabic Quran, because I want to look at another angle, another angle. Now, brother, you know Arabic better than me. The Arabic word, lam ain lam, lal, lam ain lam. Here's la how. La 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 Thank you, brother. I was saying lal, like lullaby, hush, little dog. Oh, it, it's okay, you're forgiven, man, you know. Hush, little darling, don't see. That's a lullaby. So how do you say it in Arabic? La Allah. La Allah. I like that. La Allah. La Allah. Okay, anyway. Lam ain lam. Here's how. Guys, this word, lam ain lam. Those are the alphabets. This is the root. Here's how one Muslim lexical source defines this term. Perhaps. Maybe. Maybe that. It is hoped. To be happy, it is used to denote either a state of hope or fear, whether that state pertains to the speaker or to the addressee or to someone else, expectation. Okay, guys, this very word is used of Allah for Allah. Here you go. Okay. Chapter 2, verse 186. Chapter 2, verse 186. And when my servants question thee concerning me, I am near to answer the call of the caller. When he calls to me, so that let them respond to me and let them believe in me, perhaps, perhaps, the Arabic is that word I just gave you, they will go aright. Did you see what Allah said, brother? 
He said, perhaps, and the Arabic word is la al. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, la al. So perhaps is la al, basically. So yeah. wait, Allah is saying perhaps la al. He doesn't know. Perhaps they will go all right. Oh, but it's going to get worse. This very word that I'm giving you, brethren, is used in all these verses in reference to Allah saying, maybe, perhaps, hopefully. This is Allah speaking about himself. Chapter 6, verse 151. Chapter 6, verse 151. And warn therewith those who fear they shall be mustered to their Lord. They have apart from Allah, no protector, no intercessor. Perhaps they will fear. Brother, even Allah is not certain whether they're going to fear. Maybe, perhaps they will fear. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 69. Boy, this Allah is getting me tired. Chapter 6, verse 69. The righteous are not responsible for the utterances of those people, but it may help to remind them. Perhaps they may be saved. Wait, Allah, you don't know for certain whether they will respond and be saved? Perhaps they'll be saved. Maybe they'll be saved. We hope they'll be saved. That's what the Arabic means. Chapter 7, verse 168. Chapter 7, verse 168. And we cup them up into nations in the earth, some of them righteous and some of them otherwise. And we tried them with good things and evil that perhaps they should return. Maybe they'll return after we do this to them. Perhaps. few more. few more. 1644. We provided them with proofs and scriptures, 1644. And we sent down to you this message to proclaim for the people everything that is sent down to them. Perhaps they will reflect. Maybe, Muhammad, perhaps they will reflect when you recite what we gave to you. Perhaps, maybe, Allah, you don't know. 2851, chapter 28, verse 51. And now verily we have caused the word to reach them that perhaps they may give heed. So Muhammad, we sent you with the word. Perhaps now they will give heed. Perhaps they will believe. Perhaps they will turn. Perhaps they'll be saved. Wow, this Allah doesn't sound like he knows the future, brother. Two more. Okay. Chapter 43, verse 48. Chapter 43, verse 48. Every sign we showed them was bigger than the one before it. We afflicted them with the plagues. Perhaps they repent. Perhaps they repent. 4627. 4627. And verily, we have destroyed townships round about you and displayed our revelation that perhaps, maybe, we don't know, maybe, we're hoping, perhaps they might return. Now, folks, do you understand? This is the Arabic. These translations are translating the Arabic that Allah used correctly. They're translating it correctly. And that word means perhaps, hoping for, expecting. It may turn out this way. And this is Allah speaking about himself, putting people in certain situations, tempting people, testing people, so that he may know, may learn, may discover something about them. And he sends Muhammad with the message, hoping that they'll turn. Perhaps they'll turn because Allah doesn't really know after all. Now, brother, if I have a few more minutes, there's one that really, really I love because it shows the Quran is a joke, that the Muslim God is a fake God and Muhammad is a fake prophet. Can we look at that? May uh, peace be upon him. Yeah, all sure. Right. Uh, what, okay, what, now, what I want you to do, brother... Because I want you to also look at the Arabic. Go to 48, verse 27. Chapter 48, verse 27. Open up and have the Arabic because I want you to tell people what the Arabic says. One second. 48, 27. All right. Surat al Fat. Fat. I love how you pronounce it. 27. Okay. So go ahead. What would you like me to look at? Okay, I'm going to read the English, and you're going to confirm in Arabic what I'm about to say. Guys, remember, this is Allah speaking. It's not Muhammad. The Quran is the speech of Allah, word for word, dictated by Allah. So don't forget. Keep that in mind. Okay, notice what Allah is saying. And I'm going to give you historical context. It's in my article. I quote Ibn Kathir. Huge 
embarrassment. And I quote Sa'il Bukhari, Sa'il Bukhari, Ibn Kathir, <clears throat> to confirm this. In this particular article I'm reading, I give you Bukhari. Okay, watch. Indeed, Allah shall ful fulfill the true vision which he showed to his messenger. I'm using Hilali Khan because they provide comments and brackets and parentheses so you can get an idea of what in the world this verse is talking about. Indeed, Allah shall fulfill the true vision which he showed to his messenger, i.e. the prophet saw a dream that he has entered Mecca along with his companions, having their head, their hair shaved, and cut short. And very truth. So Allah has shown you, Muhammad, a vision. You'd enter Mecca, your head shaved, entering. Okay. Certainly, you shall enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Supposedly, Al-Masjid Al-Haram is supposed to be the Kaaba and Mecca. But thanks to the research of Dan Gibson, as championed by our brother Jay Smith and you, now we know that the evidence is overwhelming. The archaeological evidence is overwhelming. It's not Mecca. It's Petra to the north. Book it a man. Book it a man. Book it a man. All right. I have to do that, brother. And, and now we're going to get sued by Jay. Okay. That's Ooh, fine. Do, do, do. All right. Now, let me read this part so you guys get it. Allah says to Muhammad, certainly you shall enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram if Allah wills. Secure having your head shaved and some having your head hair cut short, having no fear. He knew what you knew not, and he granted besides that a near victory. Now, watch this part again. Certainly, Muhammad, certainly you shall enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram if Allah wills. What's the Arabic, brother? Inshallah. Okay, uh. now, brother, as an Arab, used to be a Muslim. Don't Muslims say, inshallah, if so, inshallah, what does that mean and why do they say it? If Allah wills, and it has to do with the doctrine of predestination that you and I talked about before, but basically because they do not know if Allah wills for them to do something, then it will happen. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying that the reason why the Muslims say, inshallah, is because they don't know no. whether Allah has willed that they're going to do this or go somewhere, so they have to be cautious if Allah wills? Yeah, yeah, we have a Muslim babbler here, you know, Muhammad Suhaib Khan. Maybe he can comment on this. And he can call me on Skype if he wants to challenge exactly. me. Exactly. Hey, Muhammad, we would love for you to call him on Skype right now. Yes, and then, yes, and if you start screaming and insulting, we'll block you. But if you're going to answer, here you go. Here's my Skype name. I'm going to open up for you, Benny underscore Malik 3. But now, guys, I don't know if you caught it. Allah is speaking. Allah is speaking, and he says to Muhammad, certainly, Muhammad, You'll enter Masjid al-Haram, insha'Allah. Allah says, you will certainly enter Masjid al-Haram if Allah wills. Why is Allah saying, if Allah wills, insha'Allah? Doesn't Allah know what he wills? Doesn't Allah know what his will is already? Doesn't Allah know that it's his will is for Muhammad to enter? So why would Allah have to say, certainly Muhammad, you'll enter al Masjid al-Haram, if Allah wills, yeah, exactly. But you should know what your will is. You're Allah, you're Almighty, right? So, do you know whether it's your will for Muhammad to enter or not? Why is he saying, Inshallah? Now, let me give you the embarrassment. Are you ready for the embarrassment? Oh, you mean all of this was an embarrassment and you still have more? No, brother, not yet. And by the way, for a late night, we still got 200, which is good for a Sunday because most people are going to church. But glory to God. May the Lord increase your numbers. And may the Lord increase your support. We want you fully supported in Jesus' name. Lord, bless your servant who loves you. Same Say to now. you, brother. Same to you. Where, where is this uh, uh, Muhammad Suhaib Khan? I mean, is he like praying right now to see if he want to call us or not? Because remember, he doesn't know if Allah knows what his will is. He doesn't right. know if Allah knows what his will is. But now let me get you the embarrassment. This is in that document. We gave you the links. This comes from Bukhari. This comes from the Muslim scholars like Ibn Kathir. Do you know why chapter 4827 was composed? Let me now give you the embarrassing details. Muhammad told his companions, Allah had given them a vision that they're going to perform Umrah. Umrah is the lesser pilgrimage. So we're going to Mecca and no one will bar us from entering Mecca. So they all get ready. They get their animals. They bring their families. They get their pilgrimage outfits and they're heading towards Mecca. I'm sorry, yeah, Mecca from Medina. 
Because Muhammad said, Allah gave him a vision. They're entering Mecca to perform the pilgrimage, the lesser pilgrimage. Before they could get there, a contingent of Meccan Arabs meet him at Hudaybiyah and stop him. They go, no, Muhammad, you're not entering. Not this year anyway. So out of embarrassment, they force Muhammad to make a treaty with them. This is known as the Treaty of El Hudaybiyah. The treaty said Muhammad will not enter that year, but he'll enter the following year. Muhammad accepted. The, the pagans, actually, in the treaty. The treaty that they signed with Muhammad, they stipulated, Muhammad, you won't enter this year. You'll enter the following year. Muhammad agreed. They also made Muhammad accept the following demand. Anyone who's defected to you from us, you must bring them to us. You must send them back to us. So if there's a Meccan who becomes a Muslim and goes to Medina, you have to send him back or her back to us. Whereas if any one of your men or women defect to us, we are under no obligation to send them back to you. Muhammad accepted. The Muslims were livid. Umar ibn al-Khattab was livid. And to add insult to injury, when Muhammad wanted to sign his name, Muhammad Rasulullah, the pagan, pagan said, no, by Allah, if we thought you were his messenger, we would accept. Rather write Muhammad, son of Abdullah. And Muhammad told Ali to write it. Ali said, I won't do that. So Muhammad said, okay, I'll do it. And he wrote Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Oh, wait, what? wait, wait. Muhammad wrote it? I thought he's uh, he's an uh, illiterate guy. What's going on oh, here, man? Yes, right. Well, they said by that time, he knew how to scribble his name. You so mean wrote, Allah didn't know that he knows how to write also? Oh, dear Lord. Oh, but they'll tell you. I've heard Muslims say, oh, but that time he was older and he knew how to scribble his name. Come on, man. Give him a bit of a doubt. He knew how to scribble his name. You get it? Got it, man. At Got least it. he knew how to scribble his name. But now understand why this is embarrassing. Muhammad said Allah gave him a vision that he and his companions are entering Mecca to perform the lesser pilgrimage called Umrah. So they all get their pilgrimage clothes, their animals, their families, they're heading out that way. They get stopped at Hudaybiyah. The pagans embarrass Muhammad, forcing him to return back and signing a treaty, agreeing to their demands, demands that were humiliating. The Muslims were livid. Umar was livid. He said, aren't you the messenger of Allah? Didn't you say we would enter Mecca this year? Do you know what Muhammad said? I'm not making it up. This is in Bukhari. This is in the commentators. You know what Muhammad said to Umar when Umar was rebuking him? I thought you're the messenger of Allah. And you're agreeing to their demands? Didn't you say we'd enter Mecca this year? You know what he said? Did I say this year? I didn't say this year. Yeah, I never probably. told you this year. That's actually what Muhammad is reported to have said. Didn't you say we'd enter Mecca? And he said, I didn't say this year. Did I say this year? So now let's figure that one out. Okay, guys, let's figure that one out. So Muhammad, you get all of us dressed and ready to go to perform the lesser pilgrimage, Umrah. You get us to bring our animals and our families only to say that I didn't say this year. So why in the world did you get us all dressed up, bring all our families, all our animals, if you didn't intend for us to enter this year to perform the lesser pilgrimage? Are you serious? Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. I didn't say this year. So why did you waste our time? Why did you get us dressed? Why did you make us bring our animals and our families to perform a pilgrimage that you didn't mean now, but maybe sometime in the future. And they were livid with him. They were angry with him. I mean, he so just wanted to show them that Allah knows best. Exactly. Now you understand why Allah, after making that mistake, making that boo-boo, said, yes, the vision is true. You will certainly enter Mecca if Allah wills. I better be careful because last time when I showed him the vision, and I said he's going to perform Umrah. That didn't happen. The pagans proved to be more powerful than me and my messenger. Oops. So I better be careful. You're going to enter if Allah wills. There you go. Yeah. And that's all she wrote, you know.
And Allah go. himself says, inshallah. I mean, yeah. this uh, maybe he didn't get the morning briefing, you know, from the uh, angels, the one on the right and the one on the left. So that's why he didn't know what was going to happen. You got it. So, and by the way, I'm not making it up. This is from Bukhari. This is from Ibn Kathir. I cite the Muslim sources saying, this is why 4827 was revealed. That's why Muhammad signed what is known as the Treaty of El Hudaybiyah. Guys, you've heard of the treaty. It was a 10-year truce, a treaty, which Muhammad violated. We should do a session on how Mo Muhammad proved treacherous to his to that treaty. Oh, yeah, because he's a liar and deceiver like his God. We need to do a session on that, God willing, maybe this week. But I want you to see that the treaty of El Hudaybiyah was actually written because Muhammad embarrassed and humiliated himself, thanks be to his God, who deceived him into thinking through a vision, you're going to enter Mecca. When he didn't enter Mecca, the Muslims were livid and angry that Muhammad got humiliated by the pagans. And he said, hey, but did I say this here? I didn't say this here. So you just decided to pack up, bring us with you with our families and the animals because you had no intention for us to make the pilgrimage this year. Yeah, you make sense. Yeah. Well, brother, so are you telling me when you're in Orlando or Florida in general, you'll be able to do this yes. with us? Lord willing, I'll have internet connection and pray for my traveling mercies that God will save me from COVID. The Lord give me the discipline, self-control to keep on my path of getting healthier. Holy unto the Lord Jesus for the provisions, for divine appointments to be used of God there. And that the Lord will watch over my daughters. But Lord willing, while I'm there, I'll be writing and doing live streams. That'll be great. And I know because of the difference of time. So I want to be sensitive uh, to you. To your we will time. be three hours ahead of you, but that's okay. Three hours is a member. I'm still used to this time. So what's 1 a.m. will be uh, three hours behind. Uh, so I'll still be okay. That's fine. If you want to uh, have a cup of warm milk, you know, and, uh, and do right. this, that'll be great. I'm, uh, but I'm still on our time. Whatever our time is. So even though it's one there, I'll still be functioning on this time. So I'll be okay. Very good. All right, brother. Anything else you want to mention to people? Any special uh, shows, uh, events uh, yeah. that are of importance that you want to share with people? No, I'll be doing some shows this week. Finish some of the series I began. I will be doing a series of rebuttals to James White. I know some people may not like that, but it's okay. He can rebut brothers. We can rebut him out of love. For the grace of God, I'll be doing some more rebuttals to Uthman Ibn Farouk of One Message Foundation in preparation for our showdown, God willing. I'll be finishing my series on the biblical basis for the Nicene Creed, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, and as well as our Lord's Prayer and other topics. I'll be having open Skype Q&A and so on and so forth. And I start a new series refuting the Jehovah Witness brochure, their booklet, brochure, whatever you want to call it. Should you believe in the Trinity? I already did part one today. I refuted their misuse of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, where Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, God is the head of Christ. What does it mean for the Father to be the head of Christ? Does this disprove the Trinity? I, I did it today. I finished it today. That's part one in an ongoing series, if the Lord wills. So make sure to watch those series. Make sure that you go to the description box. And I've also pinned it as a comment. Because I give you links to articles where I discuss this material in written format. So use the material for the glory of Jesus. Pray for our brother. Pray for his family. Pray that he gets more subscribers and more patron supporters. We need him and Usama Dokdok and others like him fully supported for ministry. We need you too, my brother, and God's uh, you know uh, grace. And uh, uh, we appreciate you taking time to do this. And uh, also, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing a couple of those next week with you as well. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully, you find these uh, shows that, by the way, we really stay up late to do them. It's not just for us to have viewers, but we want you to go and share it now and teach it and yes. you know use it for God's glory. So uh, that's why we do what we do. It's not about us collecting it you know, in our uh, channel only. So hopefully you guys are taking the time to do this. Amen. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, shoot him my way or shoot him Sam's way, and uh, we will make sure we use them as a material for the next show as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, brother. Uh, this Thank is you. our party over and out. God bless. Amen.